and um, welcome to the English part here um, of the antenna analyzer VA4 and VA5. I will take you to some insights here in the next half hour. So we will move through um, different phases. So what is the motivation here for the development, the principles of operations, highlights, accuracy, simple applications and also advanced applications, right? So do we need another antenna analyzer, right? There are a lot of units out in the market and you can see, uh, first of all, some good things here from Rick Expert, but also very much established MFJ um, and also some stationary um, um, units here like uh, the SDR kits from Professor Thomas Bayer and SDR kits, which is nice. But the question is, do we have someone who really, a unit who really integrates cost, mobility, accuracy, user-friendly, and it's also a little bit do-it-yourself-like? And the answer is no. So this was the decision to develop a net antenna analyzer here from scratch in a very different way. And I would like to take you through the principles of operation, so how it works in the next half hour. Um, so how did it start? Um, of course, um, before building something on breadboard here, we need to have an idea how it works. So mathematics is first, and then the second is simulation, right? With spice, etc. But you arrive at some point where you have to now prove the concept. And here the concept is built uh, with a model which mixes down to baseband. And you can see we have an inductor here of 12.4 microhenries. And also this model on the breadboard shows this inductance. So for low Cree frequencies, we can still use this methodology. Um, the next one is to use a little bit more high frequency components if we use a buck style. Um, mode here. So we move the frequency um, critical components out to a PCB and it works again. Then we move to some pi prototypes here on a PCB and different models and you will recognize that there is also a model with a two-line display. This has been published in the American uh, paper Quex but um, very fast in Germany we decided we will only move on with the graphical version because it gives so much advantage even if it's a little bit higher priced than the um, two-line uh, display type. So this is the first prototype built uh, together with the colleagues from Funk Amateur, the VA4 and then the VA5. And I need to say I have to thank many, many colleagues also from the US who sent in a lot of interesting comments and requests about what to improve and um, as far as I remember everything went into the VA5. Okay, so thanks to all of you. Um, so how does it work? Um, measuring um, standing wave ratio and also impedance is pretty much about using Ohm's law. So what we need to do is if we have an antenna or another device under test we just need to apply a signal on it, measure the voltage, and measure the current through it, and the relation is the impedance. Um, there is a trick. Because we cannot easily measure current, we measure a second voltage here along a well-known Ohm's resistor, right? So this leaves us here to this formula. Of course, the world is more complex because we measure complex impedances, that means there is a difference in phase between the voltages of the current and the voltage. So also we know we can build our device under test here with equivalent circuits shown here, serial models, parallel models. So the question is, how can we build such a handy device here to measure that exactly? And um, it's a little bit with complex mathematics, but don't bother here, at the end, it ends up all this equation which shows we just have to measure the absolute value ratio of the two voltages and multiply it with the phase difference, with the cosine of the phase difference to get the resistance, this one, and um, if we multiply it with the sine of the phase difference we get the reactance which can be capacitive or inductance. And if we have that, we can calculate everything else from these numbers. So, the capacity of the equivalent circuit, the inductance of the equivalent circuit, we can calculate the reflection coefficient, we can calculate the standing wave ratio, and we can do it vice versa, right? So, 
And so the, the recipe is simply to apply a signal to measure two voltages to get the absolute ratio of the voltages to measure the phase difference and then we are done. It sounds easy, it's not. <laughs> so as you can imagine, it gets complex in the detail and I have to say here, normally network analyzers do not use this principle. They measure the reflection coefficient directly and then use this formula to calculate back to the impedance and to standing wave ratio. But it's not a problem, it's exactly the same. And honestly, what we simply do here is we measure two linearly independent voltages wherever we take them from the measurement service, uh, circuit, it doesn't matter, we can always arrive at reflection coefficient and impedance, right? And this is just an example. Of course, the VA4 and VA5 works a little bit different here, um, measuring the different voltages. So, what else? So how does it work in detail? Um, this is an overview circuit here um, of the VA4 and VA5. You can see we use a signal um, source. Um, normally there is a DDS used, a direct digital synthesis a source, but to make it more competitive, and uh, we use the well-known SI5351 from Silicon Labs. So this is uh, nowadays um, very much used in amateur radio um, because it allows for very little money to produce square waves uh, down to sub hertz um, resolution. Then we uh, apply this signal here, um, it's, sorry it's in German here, but it's exactly the same, to a, to a, to a bridge, to a measurement bridge. And uh, on this measurement bridge we measure two linear independent voltages. Here we have shown uh, the voltage U2 and the voltage U2, the uh, U1, the arms voltage. I don't do that in the VA5 and VA4, I measure two other things, right? Because it's down to ground, it's easier to do it, but it doesn't matter. If we have these two voltages, we put them on a mixer. And this is another advantage of this unit. It uses an analog switch as a mixer. Very cheap, very powerful, even if it's an active device, it's a passive mixer, so high IP3 and all this stuff. What we get there is a triangle wave, and these are all real plots, right? So no simulation, it's real plots. We get a triangle wave, mixing a rectangle here, putting a local oscillator also from the SI as a rectangle. Rectangle multiplied by rectangle, we get a triangle. I will tell you later why it happens. Then we do an analog digital conversion, and uh, again, very unusual components. So MCP3911 is again from Microchip, and it's a 24-bit ADC, so very, very accurate, high oversampling, and it's uh, designed to work in energy measurement. And as you can imagine, energy measurement is a mass market, so therefore it's not very expensive, right? It's quite cheap. And we arrive at this intermediate frequency, and again, these are samples taken from the memory, so they are real. We can see two triangles. One triangle is uh, the voltage, the first voltage, it's the red curve, and the other voltage is the blue curve, which is the second voltage. There is no phase difference here in this plot because um, Z was exactly 50 ohm only reactance, uh, sorry, only resistance, right? So therefore there's no phase difference between here the two voltages. What we need to do then is to take the single, uh, signal and the samples and move to digital signal processing. And this was one of the principles of the unit to move to digital signal processing as fast as possible because we cannot do such accurate things in analog, right? Um, of course you can um, get phase difference by ORing and PLLs and all this stuff, but I will tell you later, forget about high accuracy, it will not work. We have to do this in, with digital signal processing. So what we do is here, to use these two samples of the two voltages, put it through a filter, a bandpass filter, to, to select the necessary intermediate frequency, and at the same time use the Hilbert transform to later on mathematically um, arrive at phase difference and absolute value comparison, right? This is quite complex, so I will not touch it here in detail. So, this is the outcome after filtering. Very interesting here, you can see 
just for one voltage now, but if it works for one, it will work for the other. The blue triangle is one of the voltages after low pass filtering, as you can see here. Here the red one is the blue one here. Then we throw it through the band pass and do a Hilbert transform and we get two sine waves with a phase difference of 90 degrees and if we compare this sine waves with the sine waves of the second signal we can exactly analyze and get the phase difference of these voltages and also the absolute values. So the rest is calculation we will arrive at the complex impedance and calculate everything else. The VA5 got two more components, or no, four more components. Uh, we moved to a temperature controlled crystal oscillator to be very accurate, 0 0.5 parts per million, USB interface, real time clock, and also a buzzer. Because some people said we want to have a buzzer inside to turn and adjust the antenna and at the same time just listen if the SWR gets better. So this is included. So how does it work? Mixing rectangle signals. Um, so most of you probably know a Fourier transform. So what Fourier is our friend. Fourier says if we take a base sine frequency and the third harmonic and the fifth harmonic and the seventh harmonics and superposition them, we will more and more arrive at a rectangle. And here you can see the frequency components. It's a never ending series but I've just shown here the first two terms of the series. So the idea is to mathematically express our rectangle system by a Fourier series. Here we have the mixer entry signal from the bridgehead and we have the local oscillator signal. Okay, And uh, the mixer entry signal has the frequency omega s for signal and this omega zero for LO. So what happens if we mix? We multiply. So we multiply the mixer entry signal and in the vertical with the local oscillator signal. And if you do this very thoroughly, you arrive at a big, big table. <laughs> so I have done that for you so you don't need to do it again. <laughs> so um, the interesting thing is we do low pass filtering so that means all components which have high frequencies can be negligiated, right? So here omega s three times omega zero, five times omega zero. So all these white boxes don't matter because after low pass filtering they are gone. What, what, is, uh, what does matter at the end is the diagonal. And uh, we have um, um, a current, um, we have a base voltage here, you can see, uh, which doesn't have any usage for us as we work with intermediate frequency. And then interestingly, we have other terms, high frequency, okay, forget about them, low pass filtering. But here we have a component which shows the intermediate frequency. And here we have a component which shows three times the intermediate frequency. So what does it mean? It means even if I use rectangle signal, mixing with a rectangle signal, if I'm able to isolate this component, I can do exactly the same as I mix the base frequencies. Okay? so. And if I'm able to isolate the third three times the intermediate frequency, it's the same as if I mix the first harmonics, the third harmonics, sorry. So that means by just using digital signal processing and switching the intermediate frequency, I can measure phase difference and voltage ratio at the very same time for the base frequency, for the third harmonic, for the fifth harmonic, for the seventh harmonic. And this is exactly what the VA5 does. The VA4 just takes the intermediate frequency, by the way it's one kilohertz here, and measures up to 100 megahertz. But the SE just works up to 200 megahertz, so we use for the VA5 for 200 to 600 megahertz the third intermediate frequency, okay? And uh, this is the way how it reaches 700 600 megahertz. So, what other highlights do we have for those two units? Um, we touch the different components uh, to make it precisely attractive. Um, another system which is coming from professional environment is this short open load calibration. Um, in the long time ago, when I was young, right, a long time ago, um, we tried, we tried, <laughs> we tried to 
compensate um, capacity, uh, so parasitic capacity and inductance by doing vice versa and turning a little bit, this will not happen, this will not work with a handheld device. It will never happen, right? So what we do today is we use mathematics. So that means we accept that there are errors because the traces on the PCB have different lengths and all this stuff, right? So it's all important. And simulate an ideal measurement bridge and an error network. And the real question is now, am I able to eliminate this error network if I attach at the very end three things, a short, an open, and load, to tell the mathematics how this error network can be eliminated. And for sure, we are able to do this, right? Every vector analyzer from the professional area does use this methodology. So what else do we have? Low power, you can measure 40 hours with just two AA batteries, okay? Uh, light white, large display, easy kit, we, we touch that. So what is new with the VA5? Um, first of all, 600 megahertz, which is very important to cover the 70 centimeter band and also the two meter band for us uh, ham radios. The USB interface has two big advantages. One advantage is that we can attach to the VNWA software from Professor Bayer. We have seen that, right? So this is a very, very mature software with so many features and we can do everything with this software which is capable for a one-door measurement with a reflection a coefficient. So, and I will come to it uh, in a few minutes here. So very powerful PC application using this just as the front end, as the measurement front end. The second thing is this USB interface allows to update the firmware by the user. And um, it's a secure methodology, so a part of this update, the bootloader, will always stay in the machine. So that means even if you plug out the cable during the update, you are able to restart it. So don't be afraid about that, okay? <laughs> um, so what else? Uh, we touched uh, this acoustic mode real-time clock is integrated to simply allow to identify all saved data sets by a timestamp, date and time. Um, smaller dimensions, new processors, still 16 bits. By the way, I did a lot of testing with 32-bit processors from Microship. And at the very end, we said, it, it's not needed, right? Because what the performance we need here and the technology is well done by just digital signal processor 16-bit. So it was no advantage. It was just higher cost and higher power consumption. So we decided to stay on the 60-bit processor um, many other improvements here, as you can say, I will not touch everything, but uh, calculation here for different uh, base impedances, selectable DSP modes, so many other things. At the end, the question is, how accurate is the device? And uh, very common measure, uh, methodologies to measure accuracy are, for example, measuring the dynamic range return loss. So that means we calibrate and measure a load. And uh, what you can see here is, first of all, a red curve and a blue curve for two different DSP modes. So the red one is for the fast DSP mode, which you can select in VNWA or also locally. And the blue one is for the precise mode. There is another one standard, I skipped it here. So if we see this is minus 70 dBs, even in the fast mode, up to 200 megahertz, we have more than 70 dB dynamic range. Um, if we take the precise mode, we even go to 80 dB, and these are fantastic numbers, right? If we move to harmonic mixing, we can see that it gets a little bit worse because the amplitudes get lower, but in, at the very bad thing here, you can see that it's still around 40 dBs. And 40 dBs is completely enough to measure standing wave ratio in the 70 centimeter band more exactly than you can do with any analog meter. So it's exactly enough, right? So you can estimate here what does it mean. Let me have a look here. So if we take this marker, number four, number four, 549 megahertz, you can see here the return loss dynamic range. So it means, it tells me, I don't have a lot of 50 ohms, I have a lot of 49.97. 
it doesn't matter, right? So at SWR, it tells me at the very worst thing, I don't have an SWR of 1, I have one of 1.03. So in practical reasons, it doesn't matter, right? So the second thing is about linearity, and uh, what is commonly used here to measure linearity is simply attaching after calibration a very good high, a very low loss open end cable. Here you can see a semi rigid, and uh, the question is now how does it how does it uh, work in the Smith chart? So the idea is the open end cable for DC current, which at the very right side is an open cable, so that means the impedance is infinity. If we um, in increase the frequency, it goes around the circle and arrives here at the point of short, because then it's a lambda fourth transformer. And this goes on and on and on, right? So the question is, how good does it follow the outer circle in the Smith chart? And as you can see here, except two small minimas, maximas here, up to 200 megahertz, it's very precise. So we can use also very precise measurements. So the last thing is, um, how does it compare with other, other analyzers? And the uh, ARRL colleagues uh, from the US have done a fantastic job here because they compared different handheld analyzers, a Comet, an MFJ, a Rig Expert, AA50A, a UKITS, etc. And what they did is they attached different loads to the different units and compared it with a reference instrument which was from Agile and very precise, which is, by the way, maybe the best methodology here to really say how accurate is it. And have a look, 200 ohms attached, which is a WSR of a standing wave ratio of four. So how does it show up in the different units? 210 ohms, MFJ 132, Rick Expert 164, high reactance, where it comes from. UKIT's quite accurate, and the Agilent is shown 199, right? Um, so how does it compare at 1,000 ohms, which is an SWR of 20, at 28 megahertz, 200 ohms? Most of the units don't even show anything. They cannot measure 1,000 um, ohms. Um, the RIG Expert, 202 ohms, and the Agilent is still going good. So how does the VA4 perform? I have rebuilt um, the methodology AAL uh, uses here, and for 28 megahertz, and um, here um, the line, which is 1,000 ohms, you can see 986 ohms, so quite good. And for 50 megahertz and 200 ohms, 201 ohms. So at least it shows a tendency that this is very accurate. Can we get more accurate? Yes, we can. <laughs> yes, we can. <laughs> This was a different president, wasn't it? <laughs> um, the question is, can we use short open load calibration to get even a higher accuracy, and we can do. So what you can see on the left is um, the absolute and the relative error for such a measurement bridge we use in these units. And um, you can read it as follows. So if I measure the ratio of the voltages just for 0.001 wrongly, what error do I get? For 100, is it 100, 200 ohms, you get an error, absolute error, the blue line here, very low, right? If you go to 1,000 ohms, you get a very high error in absolute and also in relative. If you go to the left part, the absolute error is quite low, but relatively it's high. So that means these bridges do measure good at the impedance they are designed for. For the VA5, it's 25 ohm. This is the best point of measurement. So why the hell do we calibrate at short and um, open? Of course, there are good reasons to do it. We know it, right? But the question is, do I get more precise if I use a resistor, resistor, resistor calibration? So do it here in the area where I have the best, highest accuracy, and we can do this. And the good news is we can also use VNWA to simulate this and to do it because you can put in, in this software, quite arbitrary numbers for the different um, calibration elements. And have a look at the results, the quick results here for 50 ohms. In the high area, we have some 
difference. In the low area, we have a little bit more different. If I use 50 ohm loads, it changes a little bit, but not really. If I do a RRR calibration, of course, for 15 ohm, as it is the norm, it's 0%, but at 5 ohm, it's just 0.4%. And here, at the very end, it's just 0.5%. So that means there is definitely room to do more experiments and to do more calculations to use such kind of um, calibration methodologies to use higher accuracy. Um, very quickly, just two minutes, um, what can I do with this, such a unit? So first of all, I can measure antennas. That's what it is designed for. I can measure here at the incoming card of the cable which feeds to the antenna feed point of course it's not measuring correctly because this is a transmission line transformer right so that means normally I have to measure here at the antenna feed point which is not easy if you have a 20 or 30 meter tower so the alternative approach is to include the cable in the calibration so I, I disconnect the cable I calibrate it here and put it on here again and then I know exactly the right um, SWI and impedance for this feed point. The other thing is I can use a different methodology. Um, I can shift the measurement plane from here to there. So that means I'm still calibrating here locally in the shack, which is easy. Attach it to the cable and I know the attenuation of the cable and the delay time. And uh, if I enter the delay times either in VNWA or in the local unit, I can shift the measurement plane to the feed point and also apply the attenuation and have exactly the right impedance at SWR for the feed point. This is very interesting, right? It means you just have to do one time, measure the attenuation, you have to think about the delay time, and then you are done. You can always measure in your check. Um, of course, um, you can do some measurements of components with this. Everyone knows inductance, capacitance is frequency dependent. So this is a unit where you can measure very accurately inductance capacity along the frequency. Um, we can measure cable length. It's just as an example, I will skip it. We can do with VID NWA very advanced applications like um, having, uh, like uh, determining the, the equivalent circuit of crystals, right? So VNWA is very powerful here. It just takes the uh, parallel and serious resonance of crystals and calculates from all this the equivalent circuit. So very powerful. Um, maybe even more interesting, and this is the last one here, is about time domain measurements. So Tom told us uh, this morning uh, that VNWA is capable to transform the measurement in the frequency domain to the time domain, okay? So, how does it help? The blue line is still the frequency domain of an open end. Here you can see two cables, five meter each, connected with a BNC connector, open end. So, how does it show up in VNWA after applying all these parameters? So, the first is, this is still in the frequency domain. It's the return loss. Of course, it gets bigger if we move the frequency. Um, to the right, so that means at marker 2, at 10 megahertz, we can see 1 dB loss, which is pretty good known here from the data sheets. RG58 has 4.7 dB, 100 meters. If we take now the plot in the time domain, it shows us very interesting things. So first of all, marker 1, you can see it here, shows after 50.9 nanoseconds, which is equivalent of 5.03 meters, we have minus 32.06 dB reflection. And what is it? It's the connector, okay? And then we move on, 10 meters, it's the open end. So that means using this methodology, I'm very easy capable to um, determine discontinuities in my antenna cable, which is very, very nice. So, that's it. Um, I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Once again, thanks to a lot of people here, first of all, Thomas Bayer, but also uh, Kurt Paulsen for all the calibration, and also uh, the teams from Funkamateur and SDR Kids, who really helped to produce such a nice unit. And if you get one, enjoy it. If you have questions, contact me. This is my email address. Thanks a lot. <laughs>